We are very privileged today to have Dr. Joseph Hill, who is Professor of Medicine, Molecular Biology, James Williston, Professor of Cardiovascular Disease, and current editor of uh, Circulation. He's Chief of Cardiology, University of Texas Southwestern. The topic that we chose is something close to his heart and to the hearts of many of the people in this audience, uh, personalized heart failure. I just want to take a moment to introduce the very full panel before Dr. Fuster um, and Catherine will um, present their uh, parts of the presentation. Dr. Fuster will introduce Dr. Hill, and Catherine will give us a brief overview. Um, on the panel, um, it will be Dr. Valentin Fuster, who will have to leave um, a little bit early um, or sit from the audience, um, and Dr. Anuanu, who's a cardiac surgeon professor and vice chair, director of heart transplantation mechanical circulatory support, Raja Hajar, author and Janet Ross, professor of medicine, director of the Cardiovascular Institute here, Amy Kontorovic, medical director of adult cardiovascular genetics, assistant professor of medicine and cardiology, Jason Kovacek, Associate Professor of Medicine, Cardiology Associate Director, Interventional Structural Heart Disease here at Sinai. Dr. Sean Pinney, Director of Heart Failure and Transplantation, Director of Advanced Heart Failure and Cardiac Transplant to uh, Program. Um, Vivek Reddy, uh, Leona and Harry Helmsley Charitable Trust, Professor of Medicine and Cardiac uh, Electrophysiology. And the panel will be moderated by Donna Mancini, who is Professor of Medicine cardiology and population health science and policy. The topic, as I said, is personalized heart failure, and we're privileged to have one of our fellows, excellent fellows, Catherine Michaelis, who's going to give us a brief overview. Catherine. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Fuster and Dr. Goldman, for the opportunity to take part in this conference. Dr. Hill, I'd like to welcome you again, and thank you for joining us today to share your expertise. It's truly an honor for me to be in conversation with the distinguished members of this panel, including the editors of the two most influential journals in cardiology. Now I'll briefly introduce the topic of our panel, Personalized Heart Failure, Diagnosis and Treatment. Heart failure is a complex syndrome with a rising prevalence and a high mortality rate, approximately 50% at five years. Heart failure can be divided into the broad categories of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, HEFREF, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, HEFPEF, and the cardiomyopathies. As a result of the complicated mechanisms driving heart failure, we are recognizing increased variation in patient presentation, natural history, and therapeutic response. As our arsenal of available diagnostic and therapeutic options expands, it is crucial to devise a personalized strategy that provides each patient with the most benefit. With regard to HEFREF, neurohormonal blockade has formed the backbone of a generalized treatment approach. This is the result of multiple large-scale clinical trials demonstrating morbidity and mortality benefit. Even the newly introduced sesubitril valsartan, better known as Entresto, and Evabridine are indicated for a fairly broad population of HEFREF patients, owing to the positive results of the Paradigm HF and SHIFT trials, respectively. However, it is abundantly clear that not all HEFREF patients are the same. This has been underscored by cluster analysis revealing that distinct clinical groups of HEFREF patients have different outcomes. Additionally, in selecting HEFREF patients for cardiac resynchronization therapy, those with prolonged QRS due to left bundle branch block derive the most benefit. HEFPEF patients are generally older, predominantly female, and highly comorbid. In this population, robust treatment data does not exist. The pathway to HEFPEF is thought to be initiated by a systemic inflammatory state that induces coronary endothelial dysfunction and triggers a molecular cascade leading to myocardial stiffness and fibrosis. The end result is diastolic dysfunction. For this heterogeneous group of patients, the most rational strategy is to therapeutically target specific predisposing factors such as obesity or hypertension, and then systematically augment treatment based on symptoms such as exercise intolerance. 
For all patients with symptomatic heart failure, congestion caused by volume overload contributes to decreased quality of life and repeated hospital admissions for decompensation. Remote hemodynamic monitoring systems like the CardioMEM system or the Red Sensi Vest have demonstrated effectiveness in reducing rates of hospitalization. They do so by guiding precise diuretic dosing. The cardiomyopathies, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, are diseases of the myocardium and are typically inherited. We now know a lot about the gen genetic basis of these diseases. Genetic testing enables diagnosis of affected individuals and screening asymptomatic family members. However, there remains substantial variability in phenotypic expression, and it is not always possible to correlate genotype to phenotype. The MOGIS nomenclature allows for a more comprehensive description of each patient with respect to their complete diagnostic assessment. Additionally, it provides a foundation for designing therapeutic trials. Going forward, it will be increasingly possible to have an in-depth understanding of each heart failure patient. Ongoing investigation has led to the elucidation of the genetic mutations, epigenetics, and cellular activities like calcium signaling or autophagy that are dysregulated in heart failure. This information, in conjunction with omic strategies like genome-wide association studies to identify single nucleotide polymorphisms, is paving the way for precise diagnosis and treatment. In summary, heart failure is an incredibly complex syndrome, and each affected patient is unique. In order to provide the best care, we must personalize our approach by integrating the time-tested practice of careful history-taking and physical examination with novel diagnostic and therapeutic techniques. Thank you. I must say, Catherine, this is an excellent summary of something so complex. Uh, actually, personalized medicine in coronary artery disease is not working so well because people are not taking the few drugs that we are giving. But in heart failure, it's a situation is much more dramatic, and there are so many different possibilities that, that I think the title is quite pertinent for the discussion today. Well, for me, it's a privilege <clears throat> to introduce our visiting professor today, Dr. Joseph Hill. As you heard, he's the uh, Harry Moss, director of the Heart Center at the University of Texas, Southwestern Medical Center. And then he has two other positions. One is the chair in heart research, and is a name chair, uh, the Frank Rayburn. And then he has another name, James Willison, distinguished chair in cardiovascular diseases. So he's running the clinical as well as the research aspect of the cardiovascular center in, um, in uh, Southwestern Medical Center in Texas. Well, when one goes back to the history of this very accomplished young individual, he's, he's certainly outstanding. He had his pre-medical pre -medical studies in North Carolina at Winston-Salem. And then at Duke, he did the combined MD and PhD, and he graduated in 1987. Then he um, moved to France uh, in Paris, where he was for about four years, working at the Molecular Neurobiology Institute of Pasteur. I'm curious why you moved from the head to the heart. But anyway, this is something you might tell me a year later. All right. Uh, because today is the opposite. People are going towards the brain, so I think it's curious. Anyway, um, he, uh, he, was a, an, uh, he was an accomplishment in every aspect. He became resident at the Brigham and clinical fellow in cardiology, and then he moved into a staff position at the University of Iowa in 1997. And in 2002, he was associate professor at the University of Iowa, and then is when he moved to the University of Texas Southwestern. This was um, actually was in 2002. Then he, uh, uh, he basically moved from associate professor to professor, and, and the present uh, situation of, uh, of uh, his tenure, I already mentioned to you at the very beginning, all his positions. Now, it is difficult to summarize how somebody in a short period of time accomplished so much. Um, 
In terms of positions, uh, in 2009, he was president of the Association of Professors of Cardiology. In 2011, he became president of the Association of University Cardiologists. And then he has a number of outstanding teacher awards, 2011 at Southwestern, 2013, 2014, and so on. What happened in 2012, maybe you were a little depressed, <laughs> but uh, one year he didn't get it. Uh, he then became uh, editor-in-chief elect for circulation in 2015, and very recently he is the editor-in-chief of, of circulation. And in fact, he has been very active uh, in the journals. Uh, he has key position, uh, positions in terms of editorship in the American Journal of Physiology, in circulation research, and in many others, American Journal of Cardiology, etc. Now, <clears throat> Is, uh, he has been actually in the review panel of, of 15 NIH different groups, and this is amazing, again, into a short period of time of 10 years. He has been in 15 panels of the American Heart Association in terms of consultation, 10 on the American College of Cardiology. He also was uh, in, the, in a top position at the Sarnoff Foundation, and then he, he also is involved in a number of international groups. So um, this, from the point of view of funding, he has uh, actually one, two, three, four, five, six grants. Uh, at the present time, about four are from NIH. One is the, from the Foundation Leduc in Paris, and the other is from the American Heart Association. So the... Um, Finally, the question is what he has done other than everything I mentioned to you. Well, we always judge people for what they write and what comes out from all this intellect. And he has more than 200 papers, as I mentioned, over a short period of time. The papers go from embryology to genetics to, mole to the molecular basis and actually at the clinical level, always touching into the myocardium. And then he has a number of papers also related to cardiac arrhythmias. So here we have an individual who uh, has accomplished so much over a short period of time that, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a privilege to introduce him to you here at Mount Sinai today. So I'm going to give you to remember this uh, uh, plaque. We appreciate you for everything. There are a number of lines here. Okay, but this is basically the Anandi Sharma Visiting Professorship. This is the name in the Simon Duck Memorial Lecture. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank today. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now I think you, you, you are going to sit there in the middle, rather, and I'm going to call this distinguished group of, of panelists. Let me give this to you before. To, thank you. Uh, well, we have uh, Annie is here, yeah, and Roger, and then Amy, Jason, Simpini, Vivek ready. Is Vivek here? Fantastic. <laughs> He's always about 10, 10, 15 minutes late. So this is an accomplishment. Anyway. And now I'm going to uh, ask Dr. Mancini to come and to moderate, uh, Donna Mancini to moderate this uh, group of experts. How are you going to control them? It's a real challenge. Thank you. Um, Catherine, you did a wonderful job uh, in summarizing this topic. And I am so happy that you modified your conclusion because because uh, initially you had concluded that heart failure is a disease that's incredibly complex. And I just wanna emphasize that heart failure is a syndrome that is the result of multiple different diseases. And uh, this syndrome uh, is a constellation of signs and symptoms. Uh, and these symptoms are common to all these various disease processes. Um, our treatments are usually aimed at alleviating these symptoms, and so there's a commonality in our treatment, particularly in, in the treatment of congestion and also uh, in treatments for uh, uh, fatigue. 
So um, basically, I'd like to start out by asking the panel and each member of the panel um, what they believe personalized medicine is. Frankly, I've never heard the term until uh, Obama's address in January of 2015 when he said in the State of the Union that he was investing billions of dollars in the development of personalized medicine. And I'd like to get everyone's thoughts on exactly what personalized medicine is. Roger? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think heart failure is an excellent uh, counterexample of what personalized medicine is. We treat patients uh, based on large population studies, and we throw at them all the drugs that have been shown to improve uh, mortality or combined endpoints. Uh, and to me, uh, personalized medicine is really trying to understand how, as you said, the syndrome of heart failure affects that specific individual uh, and treating them uh, based on their specific uh, disease state as opposed to just treating the syndrome. We'll save Dr. Hill till the end. Amy? Mm -hmm. Right, I think that, um, as Catherine pointed out, there's more to personalized medicine than genetics, although I think as a knee-jerk reflex, many people assume that personalized medicine equates to genetics, per se. Um, but I don't think we're there prime time necessarily with using genetic information to predict response to therapy, for example, or course of disease. And so I think the way that Catherine outlined the um, cluster analysis that's been used is really an appropriate way to view personalized medicine using um, imaging features, uh, maybe family history, and sometimes peppered with genetic results um, to guide therapy or potentially um, that information can be used for pharmacogenetics to perhaps um, identify new therapeutic targets. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I agree with everything that Amy and Roger said, and just to, to build upon it just slightly a bit more, I think we are taking a page from oncology, who've done a very good job in describing, let's say, the, the genotype of a specific tumor and also de doing deep phenotyping to identify those specific subsets where you can predict a differential response to our pharmacotherapies to try to build upon the successes that we've already learned from large population studies. Vivek? Um, so, you know, electrophysiology is funny. We've, we went from more personalized to less personalized, I think, and maybe we'll be going back to more personalized. So if you think, for example, of sudden death um, uh, risk stratification, we started off with program stimulation to identify patients who are at high risk, ultimately found out that it doesn't work very well. Now we basically use ejection fraction, a very crude, but, but the only measure that we use. Um, there are other aspects, such as in catheter ablation, where in some sense it's personalized, where ablate the rhythm that we identify and the mechanism. In other sense, it's not. If you look at AF ablation, it's isolating the pulmonary vein. It's a very, again, crude approach. So I think that in our field, we see tantalizing sort of um, uh, tantalizing um, situations where personalized medicine could be important, such as long QT, you know, genetics, and identifying which uh, patients may respond to which drugs. And yet, in, from a very practical perspective, at least in 2016, we're not doing it in, in our clinical practice. Ani? I mean, I, I don't know what personalized medicine is, and <laughs> uh, because I, I thought that that's what doctors have been practicing for many centuries, and there are lots of good physicians here, and I thought we all practice personalized medicine, so I'll be keen to learn what it really is tonight. <laughs> Jason? I, I agree with um, everything everybody said, and I'd add my own little components, which I think there may be subcategories of heart failure that may be amenable to a personalised approach like ARVD or sarcoid, where there's a specific you know, uh, causation that's involved. But I'm struck by the juxtaposition of the poly pill, which is really the opposite approach, which is being pushed aggressively, and Dr. Fust is at the lead of that, versus personalised medicine. They're really coming at... You know, the opposite ends of the spectrum. And while the one hand we're pushing with the polypool, the other we're pushing with personalised medicine, maybe the balance remains somewhere in between or it's a little bit individualised for specific conditions. Catherine? Um, yeah, so um, I guess I'll kind of echo what uh, people have said um, before me, but I think it's always important to 
look at the patient sitting in front of you and listen to them in terms of what their symptoms are and then try to use the best uh, evidence-based medicine and then potentially if there are new techniques available to you to come up with a really uh, individualized approach for that patient. And Dr. Hill? So we've heard seven, seven versions of what it is, and, mm -hmm. and maybe I'll tell you what I think it is not. Mm -hmm. Just because it's measurable doesn't mean it's something that will be informative. I, I sometimes think, you know, it's been said that you could assign a, a GPS coordinate to every hair on your head, but it wouldn't be informative uh, in a meaningful way. And I, I believe that some people get lost in the hype of measuring all sorts of things and uh, for the sake of doing so. Uh, and um, I, I've um, been uh, sat in panels where analysts, these are mathematicians who analyze these data, have said that it, that it doesn't matter if the data are bad because our our algorithms will find that, will detect that. And I, I personally believe that's a, a huge mistake. If I'm measuring your blood pressure 24 hours a day and my, my device is off by 40 millimeters of mercury, it doesn't matter to me how good your algorithm is, it's not gonna pick that up. And I, I think we have to do the, in my opinion, do the hard work of careful measurements. It's the work that we all do, the biological phenotyping of the human species and then those data, once they have been vetted and proven to be reliable, then we can turn them into big data that can be analyzed systematically. But I, I sometimes think there's some people out there who are so enthusiastic about the notion of big data and all data are, must be worthwhile that you know, what, what really needs to happen up front, I think, gets missed sometimes. So um, in summary, basically, uh, personalized medicine or precision medicine is a combination of genetics, environment, and lifestyle. And it's trying to identify what the disease is, prevent the disease, um, and to find the best treatment for the disease. Some people describe it as finding the right drug for the right person at the right time. Um, but it's an overlap of, of several different areas, and it's not just uh, genotyping. So, Sean, do you practice personalized medicine? I like to think that I, I tailor therapies to individual patients. I don't know if that's necessarily personalized medicine in the same sense as we're describing it right now. Um, I certainly don't do genomics analysis and use that to, to tailor my therapy, but I do adjust doses based on side effects and things like that, which I think is, a, is not exactly what we mean by personalized medicine, but it is a, a way of practicing very good medicine. I think the type of medicine that I practice is still rooted in large-scale clinical trials where we treat populations. And one of the tenets of clinical trials is that if, if a drug works within a population, it's going to work for most people in that population, and that it's pretty rare to find an exception where that drug is not going to work in that individual. So I think most of my practice is still rooted in those clinical trials, still rooted in the principle of establishing guideline-directed medical therapy and targeting the doses which were successful in clinical trials, maybe not all at once, but certainly you know, escalating the doses in a similar fashion to the clinical trials which were shown to be a proven benefit. And Roger, do you agree that Sean practices personalized medicine? Uh, I mean, if he thinks he's practicing personalized medicine, <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, Sean is right. I mean, you do the, try to do the right thing for uh, most of the patients that you see, but, you know, the, 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 still these population studies are population studies. You, you have a cohort that responds and a cohort that doesn't respond. And as long as the tilt is towards the cohort that responds, then you're, you're safe in giving those agents and feeling that you're doing something for the patient. But I think still, I mean, if, if we get to the fundamental of what personalized medicine uh, trying to get to is uh, trying to understand fully the patient's disease and treating that disease. Uh, I mean, the cancer analogy uh, is a good one, but it's, it's uh, you know, proliferating cell types are just not as complex, I would, I would say, than as, as heart failure. You're trying to target that proliferating cell type, and you know what the signaling pathway is, and you go after it, 
our heart disease is much more complex than that. You know, I have to say that, Sean, I think you practice more personalized medicine than you realize. You know, I, I think a lot of your therapy is based on clinical trials. You try to prognosticate using predictive scores that we've developed. Um, you do get genetics when we identify that there's a patient who has a familial cardiomyopathy. Um, the heart failure service is participating in a polymorphic uh, um, polymorphism study, the genetic uh, AF study. Um, so I, I think you should give yourself more credit. And also, I think that heart failure physicians are probably the last group of fish physicians in cardiology who really get to know their patient. And when I was at the AHA, Robert Califf was saying that hypocrisy says it's better to know the patient than to know the disease. And I think that in the area of heart failure, we really do get to know the patient. So um, I think you yeah, pat yourself on the back, Sean. <laughs> so uh, in terms of uh, the application of genetic testing to diagnose cardiomyopathy, I think that's a major uh, element of uh, personalized precision medicine. And I actually want to present uh, a briefcase and get Dr. Um, Hill's input on it. Um, there's a young black man who is an athlete who's hypertensive, and he has mild renal insufficiency. He had palpitations, and he went to the emergency room. They did an echo. It had a lot of trabeculation on the left ventricle. Then they did an MRI, MRI. And again, it had a lot of trabeculation so that the diagnosis of non-compaction cardiomyopathy was raised. He sent to you to consider treatment with anticoagulation, antiarrhythmic prophylaxis, and consideration for transplant. What do you think that this patient has? Does he have physiologic hypertrophy? Does he have pathologic hypertrophy? Does he have a genetic defect? What do you do? Okay. Well, I mean, that's a tough one. I mean, uh, you know, I'd like to know a little bit more about his family and well, so Well, ask me. You can ask okay, me. Okay. Does anybody else in his family have a, a history of heart disease, a, an abnormal echo, sudden no. cardiac death? No. no. It, but he is, he is athletic? Yes. Well, you know, we're, as everybody knows, we're seeing a lot more of what people call non-compaction these days as our imaging methods are improving. Um, and there is this gray zone where you can't really tell if the LVH is that of athleticism versus hypertension versus some syndrome. And so um, there, that's an, a, you know, a, a cutting edge area of research nowadays is trying to, is trying to, to bend out those gray zone people mm -hmm. um, between uh, which, which it is. And, uh, you know, I'm, I won't pretend to know that the, I have the answer. Well, but, do you have any, considering your research on physiologic hypertrophy and pathologic hypertrophy, are there any biomarkers you would suggest that may be suggestive of whether this is a physiologic process versus a pathologic process? Are there any micro RNAs, anything like that that we could do? Well, no, I mean, of course, we don't routinely sample the myocardium in situations like this, but, you know, evidence of fibrosis would be a, you know, a pretty strong indicator of a pathological remodeling response as opposed to uh, athleticism. The, so the, you know, late gadolinium enhancement and so forth would, would, would tip you toward believing that this was a, you know, a pathological response. And Amy, do you think that you can help us with this? Potentially. Um, I, I mean, I think as a first step, whenever there's a consideration between pathogenic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and quote-unquote athlete's heart, asking the patient to refrain from exercise and re-imaging is an appropriate first step. And if there's re um, recession of the hypertrophy, it favors a diagnosis of athlete's heart. If not, um, there might be a role for genetic testing. And certainly if a true pathogenic variant was seen in a sarcomeric um, gene or other gene associated with HCM, it would change the course of management and have potential impact for relatives um, in that family. So I would do testing in that individual, um, regardless of whether there were other um, relatives who had a signal for HCM or another form of cardiomyopathy. So in the absence of any other relative having a signal, you wouldn't do testing? No, I would, I would do testing, even if there are no, no um, real affected relatives. Okay. 
All right, and uh, this is the second case. So um, they're two brothers. They're in their early 40s. They have heart failure. And uh, one had cabbage and has a history of pretty heavy alcohol abuse. The other one has a dilated cardiomyopathy. Both are really very ill. The one who had the cabbage and alcohol abuse ends up uh, uh, being batted and ultimately dies on the bed. The other brother um, survives to transplant. Now, these brothers presented maybe around 16 years ago. And at that time, the caring cardiologist received a phone call from a world-renowned geneticist that these brothers had familial cardiomyopathy. He highly suspected that. Now, the referring cardiologist couldn't really figure out why the geneticist really thought this, because there was no genetic mutations that were obvious, and there was no other um, family members that had cardiac disease. But she always kept it in the back of her mind that this guy may have a familial cardiomyopathy. So 16 years later, when the kits became available that you can screen people for dilated cardiomyopathy, she ordered one on the patient who was transplanted. And lo and behold, he had a Titan abnormality. So it looked like the geneticist, how I have no idea how he knew it, but he probably had a Titan cardiomyopathy. So now the cardiologist test the sons of the patient. This is um, 15 years later. The, the son now, they were each in their mid-30s. One son is positive for Titan. What do you do with that patient? What do you do with the son? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, Titan is the largest molecule in the human body, and uh, it is marked by many different mutations, many different post-translational modifications. So I, I, I can back out of this by saying I need to know a lot more about the mutation. The, the mm -hmm. Titan is famously involved in, uh, you know, the diastolic snapback of the myocyte, and mm -hmm. hence it, is, it is, participates strongly in the leucotropy response of the cell. Um, but it is, again, it is, you know, enormously long, and um, there are many, many different points at which it can be, its function can be perturbed. So I, I'd have to say I'd, I'd have to know a little bit more, you know, it, you know, it, there's a little bit of guilt by association here, you know, that, that mm. I'm, I'm not at this point convinced that that Titan mutation necessarily was, was pathogenic in this individual. So I'd, I'd have to know a little bit more about it. it. It's the mutation that was described by Christine Seidman in the, the uh, her original paper that was in the New England Journal of Medicine. Well, then, you know, if, if it's, a, if it's a, a mutation that is known to be associated with cardiomyopathy in preclinical models, then, you know, then that raises the, the specter of it being participating here. And, you know, then I think you have to think about, you know, anti-remodeling meds, you know, avoidance of competitive athleticism and so forth in, in, an, in a young person like that. Okay, so what type of, uh, would you just do an echocardiogram? Would you do an MRI? Um, what agents would you start him on, if any? I would turn to one of my advanced heart failure colleagues. Okay. <laughs> Sean. Lifeline. I would do an echo in the sun, and if it's structurally normal, I would uh, follow the advice that Dr. Hill gave, which is to avoid competitive sports and uh, follow serially with echocardiograms maybe every three years or so to see if there's a change, uh, certainly to avoid <laughs> Uh, drugs and toxins, which uh, one of his uncles partaked in and may have accelerated the course of his cardiomyopathy. But just because they have the genetic mutation doesn't mean it's going to be expressed. There may need to be some other um, in, you know, interaction with the environment to cause that uh, you know, genetic mutation to be expressed. So I wouldn't necessarily start them on any prophylactic medicines unless there's evidence of LV dysfunction. And I would just follow them with serial echocardiography and uh, follow their symptoms very closely. Um, okay, so the cardiologist did an echo, did a stress test, they were normal, did an MRI, a little bit of fibrosis, a little bit of fibrosis. 
So what do you do? Do you start a, uh, an ACE inhibitor? No. Why? Why not? Normal, normal function. Maybe they overread the MRI. Maybe they didn't overread the MRI. That's, you know, you're talking. I'm assuming that this individual is a, a young man at this point. You He's know. Uh, 35. The, yeah. the father and the uncle both got deathly ill in their early 40s. Right. So you're talking about exposing someone to a drug for a long period of time. I would wait for a little bit more compelling evidence than just a little bit of fibrosis on the MRI. You know, obviously there's no right answer. And, uh, you know, we really, the, the aim is to try to prevent the disease from forming um, before it actually occurs. So um, that's a that's a really good point, and that is that we have no data to suggest that ACE inhibitors are going to work in this situation. What you have is a little bit of fibrosis, which, if we were to take this out a little bit further, may be occurring because of a genetic mutation. But ACE inhibitors work because they block neurohormonal activation, and there has to be some signal for neurohormonal activation. And it holds in the neurohormonal hypothesis that that trigger is a drop in cardiac performance. Mm -hmm. So right now you have someone who is stage A, maybe if you want to push it a little bit, stage B, and maybe there's an indication to start an ACE inhibitor, but there's, there's no LV systolic dysfunction. There's no drop in cardiac performance. So although this may be someone who gets into trouble in time, I'm not persuaded that there's going to be a benefit in an ACE inhibitor in preventing LV remodeling or prevent the onset of, uh, of a heart failure syndrome. Well. The cardiologist didn't give him anything, but just advised him to live heart healthy. What is heart healthy? To exercise, to abstain as much as he could from alcohol, to not smoke. So he's living heart healthy right now. Amy, you were going to say something? I just want to add that the precardia trial is ongoing to answer this specific question and determine the role for ACE inhibitors in phenotype negative, genotype positive patients. You know, I would submit that your case bring, illustrates a larger point in that I think a challenge going forward is that many of the medications we use based on population-based trials, uh, the number needed to treat is not very attractive sometimes. The number in primary prevention, the number of people that we, that, we, that I give a statin to mm -hmm. relative to the number who benefit from it is 50 to 1, 80 to 1 or something. It's, mm -hmm. you know, and, and some have suggested if we if we let the world know that you know, we're giving you this medicine, even though there's really only a one out of 50 chance you're going to benefit from it, you know, and exposing you to the expense and risk that, you know, a lot of people would opt away from that. So I think that's one of the real opportunities for precision medicine is, is trying to figure out of these 50 patients, which is the one who will benefit from this medicine and uh, avoiding it in the other 49. You know, uh, at the American Heart meeting this year, there was a lot on in precision medicine. And uh, there was a lot about uh, data sharing and Dana, oh, um, at the American Heart Association this year, there was a lot about precision medicine and data sharing and data mining and collecting huge data sets. You know, I think in many ways, the Dallas Heart Study is like a, the quintessential uh, model that the government wants to follow, but just wants to uh, multiply it across the country. And I think the Dallas Heart study is a very important study. And since you're here, I thought that maybe you can give us a short synopsis on what it is, the salient findings, and whether you think that the government is realistic in, in thinking that they can just sort of multiply that and have it throughout the country. Well, certainly. The, so the Dallas Heart Study was the brainchild of my predecessor. It was not my my idea, but it was the brilliant idea of Sandy Williams, and um, he called it the the Human Heart Lab, and it was it was designed as a snapshot of the population of Dallas, Texas, which the metropolitan area is around seven million people, and it was selected to represent that population statistically speaking a little bit overweighted toward African Americans. And it was a, an exquisitely detailed phenotyping exercise. And again, I, be I believe that is the key to the success of the Dallas Heart Study that I was trying to say earlier. Garbage in and garbage out. You have to do ex extremely careful data collection 
and then bring that forward for further analyses. And Sandy and Helen Hobbs did that to their credit. So it was initially designed as a cross-sectional study of 6,000 individuals that was designed to represent the 7 million people in the region. And then of those 6,000, 3,000 were brought in for careful phenotyping. And that's what we now call Dallas Heart Study 1, a cross-sectional snapshot of those individuals. Then they were brought back seven years later, turning it into a longitudinal study. We call that Dallas Heart Study 2, so that we could track what we, what we have seen. You know, what were the indicators at this point in time that seven years later emerged as LVH or diabetes and so forth? Now we're currently planning Dallas Heart Study 3, Mm -hmm. uh, and that is slated to launch in the next couple of years. It was funded by the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation, and Helen Hobbs, who runs it now, to her credit, has convinced the institution to endow that so it will last in perpetuity. And so it has been, a, I think, a, a very good example of data sharing. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I heard Rob Califf talk about this just the other day, that that he believes that data sharing is the future of, you know, one of the most important advances going forward. And I, I certainly share that, and I'm, I'm sure Dr. Fuster does as well. Um, but you have to be careful. You know, you have to know what the data are. You know, someone said if you took the sprint trial and decided to share those data, by the time you de-identified everything so that you could not tell which patient was which, you'd have to strip out so many data fields that would almost be meaningless. And so, you know, we're playing around with information on which people base decisions about human health. And so we have to be extremely careful about what we're doing. And data sharing is important. It is unquestionably the future of our profession, but it has to be done uh, in a very circumspect uh, fashion. Yeah. Um, Vivek, I, I don't want to leave you out. So I want to ask you, do you ever um, use genotyping in the patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, in terms of timing, uh, placement of a defibrillator? Genotyping. Genotyping. No. No, and I, I think you're alluding to the fact that there are certain mutations, as you know, that, um, that have a high sudden death rate, even though the phenotypic, the LVH, et cetera, is not as dramatic. But from a very practical perspective, we really don't. Um, it's Amy, should he? Amy, should he use genotyping in uh, trying to restratify patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with their risk of sudden death? I don't think there's any evidence for a role in doing so with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There's maybe one or two examples in dilated cardiomyopathy for specific mm -hmm. genes mm -hmm. that um, have a higher sudden death risk and perhaps might tip the scale in terms of doing earlier ICD implantation. But for HCM, there's really been no malignant mutations that have borne the test of time. Um, so I think, no. I mean, in fact, in our field, I think the only time we do do genotyping are the few instances where um, we, we suspect a genetic disease like Brugada or something, and we want to try to, um, to get a diagnosis. But more frequently, in somebody that we have it and we want to screen the family, that's the only time that I can think of that we actually use it from a clinical perspective as opposed to a, as opposed to a research perspective. And even then, how much it actually affects our practice is it's still questionable. Um. Dr. Hill, your uh, lecture this afternoon was very interesting, and um, the, your emphasis on cardioplasticity um, is exciting, and probably the best scenario in heart failure where we really see cardiac plasticity is the occasional LVAD-supported patient who has myocardial recovery. Now. You um, said that patients with left ventricular assist devices have cardiac atrophy. And I'd like to ask Ani, how many explanted VADs and hearts, patients who are supported by VADs and go to transplant, are those hearts small when you take them out? Or do they have small hearts? No, no they're not small. <laughs> so why does Dr. Hill say that there's atrophy? 
I mean, I, I suspect that talking about different patients at different stages of the disease, certainly those that get to the tr transplantation, we don't see that. But so Dr. Hill? I'm wrong. So <laughs> <laughs> if, you, um, if you unload the, the failing heart, the, the myocyte atrophies uh, rather substantially. Um, you know, I think that's pretty widely accepted. And, um, you know, there's a lot of interest in the notion of myocardial recovery and, and, and Fadi Yacoub's work and so forth. And, um, you know, there's work underway, you know, at our place that I'm involved in where um, we're trying to understand that. And the longer the heart, the longer a human heart is on a vat, I can assure you, the smaller the myocytes get. There's no doubt about that. And um, the mitochondrial biomass diminishes as well. We, we talked about this. And um, the heart doesn't have to work so hard, so it doesn't need so my, many mitochondria. And there is a model that we are testing now. This is really more Hesham Sadek's work than my own. That, um, that when you unload a failing heart, unequivocally the myocytes atrophy, mitochondrial biomass goes down, reactive oxygen species levels diminish in those myocytes. All that is, 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 is quite uh, unequivocal. That ROS often triggers what's called the DNA damage response. That also, that, that's, those four points in that chain are un, unquestioned. We have a hypothesis that that DNA damage response is what keeps that myocyte out of the cell cycle. And that is why, that's why myocytes can uh, replicate in the hypoxic environment of the fetal circulation. The moment you're born and you suddenly have a, a, an adult circulation, that hypoxic state goes away and the myocytes start to work harder. Mitochondrial mass goes way, way, way up in a short period of time. Ross goes up and the DNA damage response is elicited throughout the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So. Um, one model that we're testing is that perhaps some of the recovery that has been reported that you know well may relate to the fact that long-term exposure to a VAD and the associated atrophy, myocyte atrophy response, um, down regulation of mitochondrial biomass turns off the DNA damage response, and we have experimental evidence to support that. And it looks like those myocytes re-enter the cell cycle. Mm -hmm. So I, I will grant you, trust me, I'll grant you that the VAD uh, explanted heart is does not appear to be small, but if you histologically examine those myocytes, they're atrophied. And uh, Roger, with these LVADs, you know, uh, there's a very small uh, percentage, less than 10% that it can actually recover, but there's a much larger percentage that has partial recovery. And when you look at the, the genes, there's, you know, upregulization and normalization of the genetic pattern in a lot of these patients. So do you think there's, what do you think is happening? Is there an epigenetic um, phenomenon that's going on that we're not addressing? Um, what do you think? Yeah, so, um, I mean, Magdi Yacoub's work, I mean, shows that you can recover a majority, at least in his case, using uh, this beta agonist that he uses uh, and the LVAT. I think most centers now, it's clear that very few patients can recover. And again, it's, it's, uh, if you think about personalized medicine, there's a specific percentage of patients who basically respond to the unloading in a very beneficial fashion. And by unloading uh, those cardiac cells, you're basically triggering pro-survival pathways that allows them to recover function. But in a majority of them, uh, that unloading doesn't do that. In fact, unloading induces uh, hypertrophic markers are the same as when you induce hypertrophic responses. So it's, it's kind of uh, interesting. But I think, again, I mean, we don't understand a lot of these phenomena, and that's why it requires a lot of work. But that's, again, an example of personalized medicine, how one treatment uh, can benefit a small percentage of patients, but not... Uh, uh, the totality. And uh, I'd like to just, um, my last question is um, on artificial intelligence and how this huge data mining from personalized medicine is going to enable the physician to predict behavior. And now when I go on Amazon and I go shopping, you know, the, the Amazon lady is pretty good in picking out what I might like. 
<laughs> and what I should consider. So, but the problem in medicine is that we may be able to predict behavior, but frequently we have to change behavior. And uh, Dr. Hill earlier today spoke about obesity, hypertension, diabetes being an epidemic, and that all could be addressed with exercise. So how do we get people moving? Uh, Dr. Fuster is here, so he can tell you about how uh, at uh, four-year-old uh, Okay, he's not four. Right. <laughs> he's not a child, and he's a 60-year-old man, and he has to exercise. How do you get him off the couch? <laughs> Start low and go slow. So get him to walk to the kitchen. Get him to leave the house. Get him to walk around the block. Get him to take the elevator one floor below his apartment and walk up a flight of stairs. So you set very low, tangible goals and encourage them to, to, to build from there. It occasionally works. I, mean, I always tell every one of my patients, I want you walking 30 minutes a day, and then I plan out, you know, chat with them about how you can get there. And some of them do it, a few, but not everyone. It's human mm -hmm. nature. <clears throat> David. Can, you, can I just make one comment? You know, as you know, in, in our field with atrial fibrillation, there's a very strong link between obesity and, and the absence of exercise, and you get reduced atrial fibrillation. You know, with all this data coming out, I was fairly cynical that we'd actually be able to affect any change in our patient's practice. But I have to say, you know, I spend, in my follow-ups with my patients, I spend at least half the time talking about the importance of exercise and obesity, et cetera. And surprisingly, Probably about half those patients, I may be optimistic, maybe a third of those patients actually do try, and some of them lose substantial amounts of weight. So I guess the, what I, the lesson that I've taken away from this is that I should probably be less cynical <laughs> about this, mm -hmm. and that some of our patients really will try hard after we explain the importance of, of weight reduction, et cetera. Obviously, it works on just a subset of patients, so I think it requires you know, a more holistic approach and something that I know we're trying to do here at Sinai, but... Um, I don't have any easy answers. I, I think it'd be remiss of us not to mention Dr. Fuster's work, and as part of the healthcare prevention AHA network that I'm involved with, is Dr. Fuster's leading. I think some of the early data is suggesting that for adults are very reluctant to change anything, and that an Alcoholics Anonymous type approach, where adults are partnered together, and you need to lose weight, I need to exercise, you need to stop smoking, and together the group helps itself maybe the model that needs to be implemented for adults. Children are very different, but in adults, it seems to be what's emerging. So we will need a buddy. That's what it is. We will need a buddy. So um, Dr. Fusta, do you have any questions you'd like to ask That's the panel? Um, any, any questions from the audience? All right. Yes, Dr. Shimon. Personalized medicine is an aspect, but there's personalized care. That's very important in order to get the goal. Is that very conscious in the world of medicine? Just wanted to add the term personalized care to whatever personalized medicine is. As Ani said, I hope we all practice that. that the amount of time that you need to spend with patients to change behavior and rally up families and, and it's very hard. It's very hard, but I really think it's worthwhile doing and I share uh, your experience uh, that uh, it's possible, Vivek, but uh, it, the success rate is not very high, but it requires enormous effort under personalized care to really understand who they are, what their triggers are, uh, have diet sheets in the office, uh, rally up the family, circ sometimes rotate various family members that come in in hoping that uh, that will happen. But thank you very much for the panel. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, my comment follows yours. And I'd like to make a comment about the so-called learning machines and the issue, for example, of the, um, 
of the projects that are ca being carried out by IBM, for example, with the Watson. And basically, the concept is, is very simple. You teach the machines all these variables that the machine at the very end gives you the diagnosis and what should be done with the patient. <clears throat> and for example, in the, in the issue of the athlete's heart versus IHSS, there's an article coming in Jack that was written by the group here in which they, at the very end, when you do all the sophisticated variables that you want, the most important thing is that the volume of the left ventricle and the thickness of the septum, which gives you really at the bottom line of all the variables. Well, this is all very nice, but I had the opportunity to spend an hour with, uh, with Deborah Desant, who is now the head of the Watson. Um, and here's a problem. And that is technologically, I think we are getting to a personalized approach to the patient. And this coming from the learning machines and from all these computerized systems. But there's something that people don't take into account, and it's the patient and the doctor. Because it's very simple to do personalized medicine and all of that, but is the doctor or the patient prepared to get into this? And this is very, very tricky. For example, coronary artery disease, she was saying, you know, we will be able to to really treat patients with coronary artery disease very differently. And I said to her, well, this very differently when only 50 or 30 percent actually are taking the drugs that they're supposed to take. So it's very easy to get computerized systems and robotic approaches to medicine. The question is we have to put on the other side the patient and the doctor and the adherence to the medications and so forth. I'm only presenting this because I think it's a critical issue. Everybody is now going into the robotic approach to medicine, but nobody is talking about that the patient is an emotional entity that really has to react to whatever mm -hmm. the doctors say. And I'm just making this comment because we as physicians really have to be sponsoring the patients and be very sure that we are not starting using all this technology with a complete nonsense way. It's, it's mm -hmm. just a comment. Okay. Okay, and with that comment, I'd like to thank everyone for coming today, and uh, have a happy Thanksgiving.